So, you want to learn some more science, hmm? Okay. Let's talk about evolutionary biology. Sounds intimidating, I know, but it's actually not too bad. Every living thing has a genome, a collection of blueprints that tells that organism how to make everything it needs to survive, and also how to make more of itself, how to reproduce. In the case of single-celled organisms, it might just make another copy of itself. Bacteria, for example, they reproduce asexually. They don't need a mother and a father. They can reproduce by themselves. They make a second copy of everything in the cell, and then they split themselves into two. And then that's it. If everything goes to plan, there's just another identical copy of the original cell. Of course, not everything always goes to plan. Sometimes the machines that make copies of DNA get things a little wrong. They might happen to produce a random error. That's called a mutation. Sometimes mutations are good. Sometimes they're bad. Sometimes they don't do anything. But if a mutation does something helpful, then more than likely that organism will survive, it will reproduce, and then there'll be more of that organism with that particular mutation. If that's not a helpful mutation, if it stops you from doing something you need to do in order to survive or reproduce, then you probably won't pass that mutation on, because you'll probably die. Which isn't that great from an individual point of view, but on the whole, as a species, that's a good thing. Because you don't want more of that species to have bad genes that stop it from doing what it needs to do. You see, every organism, regardless of whether it's bacteria or plant or animal or anything else, wants to reproduce. Everything that is alive wants to reproduce. Because if it had a gene that made it not want to reproduce, it wouldn't reproduce. And so it wouldn't pass on that gene that makes it not want to reproduce. It would just die out. But if something does have a gene that makes it want to reproduce, then it will probably reproduce. And then it will pass on that gene and that desire to reproduce to its offspring. So just by default, everything ends up wanting to reproduce. Otherwise, it wouldn't stick around long enough to matter. So, living things want to reproduce. They want to survive long enough so that they can get to a point where they can make offspring, and then it doesn't really matter if they live or die, as long as their offspring are okay. Of course, that's from a broader perspective, talking about a species, not an individual. Individuals want to survive. They have a drive to survive, much as they have a drive to reproduce, because if they didn't want to survive, then they probably wouldn't survive, and they wouldn't pass on that gene that makes them not want to survive. Anyway, you've probably seen something like X-Men, where evolution sounds really exciting and sexy and interesting. It's something that gives you fantastical powers. You can read minds or regenerate from injury. Unfortunately, that's not actually what evolution is all about. The evolution doesn't affect individuals. It affects populations, species. An individual doesn't evolve. An individual might have a mutation that makes its genes different from other members of its species, but it doesn't evolve. It either reproduces and passes on that mutation, or it doesn't, and that mutation stops there with it. If a mutation is beneficial, if it helps you to pass on that gene, then more than likely, that gene is going to spread throughout the population. Not throughout the population that exists right now, but in terms of future generations, you'll start to see that mutation more. Because you'll have babies, and those babies will have that mutation, and then those babies will make more babies that also have that mutation, and so it spreads and it spreads and it spreads. If the environment changes, 
and your species needs to adapt to it, you need to change. And relying on random mutation isn't the best way to do that, because you can't be sure that a random mutation is going to happen, or if it does, that it's going to be the kind of random mutation that might be helpful. It could do anything bad or good, or it might not do anything. Sexual reproduction is different. That's the kind of reproduction that human beings do, as well as animals and all sorts of other things. Picture it like this. Imagine that our genomes were recipes, like recipes for a batch of cookies. Different people have different recipes. They all have the same steps in the same basic order, but the directions for those individual steps might be a little different. Let's say that step number one for one person might be preheat the oven to 250 degrees, and someone else might have step one as preheat the oven to 270. Step two might be to break one egg and whisk it around, and step two for someone else might be break three eggs and whisk them around. Step three might be pour a whole bunch of oatmeal into a cup. And step three for someone else might be pour a whole bunch of cornflakes. You might have self-raising flour or regular flour. You might have chocolate chips or raisins, all sorts of things. So imagine that when you reproduce with someone else, you both take your recipes, you cut them up into strips for each individual step, you toss them around in a series of bags, and for each step, you just pick out one person's recipe, but you don't know whose. It's random. Doing it like this, you get very, very different recipes every time that you reproduce. And every time that you reproduce with different people, your recipes can be very, very different too. So in this way, you're still going to get cookies. They just might be very different cookies. You might get uh, preheat the oven to 250, and then... Add in three eggs, chuck in some oats, um, add a bunch of raisins, and then cook for an hour, right? That might be very different from the mother's recipe and the father's recipe, and you could well find that the cookies you get are horrible. But you might also find that you discover some really great new recipe. Now, of course, people don't actually get made up of chocolate chips and raisins and cornflakes. But you can kind of see how if people's traits are encoded by genes instead of the steps in that recipe, you can switch around the genes of the mother and the father to make a brand new person that is similar to each of the parents, but quite different from both. And that's a really good thing when situations change, when the environment changes, when it starts to get hotter, or you're moving to a new place, when food might be more scarce, or there's a new predator around. You find that with the more variation you introduce into a population, the more likely it is that someone will be better equipped for whatever it is that you're facing. Let's say you're moving to somewhere that's hotter, and there's a lot more sun then someone with dark skin might be able to benefit there more than someone with light skin. Or say that it suddenly gets very cold, then someone who has a lot more body hair is probably going to stay warmer, might be able to survive where other people can't. How about an example? Let's say there's a species of lizard. And they are yellow-skinned with brown stripes. They live in a brown, rocky desert, and... There's a species of bird that preys on them. They fly around in the sky. They see a lizard. They swoop down, pick it up, kill it, and eat it. Obviously, that's not great for the lizards. So if there's something that can help them not get eaten by birds, that's going to be beneficial. Let's say there's a male lizard, and it makes some sperm, as male lizards are wont to do. There's something that goes wrong in the production of that sperm. Let's say the gene that encodes skin color for that lizard gets swapped around because of a mutation, an error in copying. And instead of that gene encoding for yellow skin with brown stripes, 
It encodes for brown skin with yellow stripes. Now, let's say that that male lizard meets a female lizard, and they mate, and they make a baby. And the sperm with the mutation happens to get to the female's egg first. It implants in that egg, and bit by bit, that fertilized egg makes a tiny baby lizard. And that baby lizard has brown skin and yellow stripes. Now, that might be a bit of an advantage, because brown skin, you're a bit more brown, you blend in with the brown rocks, and maybe the birds don't see you as much. So maybe you don't get picked off by them, you survive. You happen to meet another lizard, and you make some babies. And because of the way that recipe gets shuffled all around, you might get a yellow lizard with yellow stripes, so a yellow lizard. You might get a brown lizard with yellow stripes, a yellow lizard with brown stripes, or you might end up getting a brown lizard with brown stripes. And if they happen to give birth to a brown lizard with brown stripes, a brown lizard, that lizard is going to blend in with the brown rocks, and that's going to be hard to see. And so that lizard's probably going to live long enough to find a mate and pass on its genes. And it might make more brown lizards. And those brown lizards might survive, because they're basically invisible to the birds. So they'll probably find mates, and they'll probably make more brown lizards. And so over time, that species of lizard will shift, will evolve, to be brown. Because... The birds can't kill the brown lizards as easily. They can't spot them. So it helps to be a brown lizard. Because the brown skin is helpful, because the birds can't see those lizards, they can't kill those lizards as easily, that's a beneficial trait. And because of that, we say that it's selected for. Something in the environment, the birds, their natural predators, can't kill them as much. So it helps the lizards to survive. And thus, it's selected for. We call that natural selection, and that influences the change in genes over time of a population. That's what evolution's all about. It can be a lot more subtle than that, and it tends to be a pretty slow process, but that's basically what it is. By introducing genetic variation, either by mutation or by sexual recombination, you can make offspring that are potentially better equipped to handle a changing environment. And when survival and reproduction is the name of the game, that can be very helpful. Basically, all living things need to do is to survive long enough to reproduce, and then hopefully maybe take care of their kids until they're old enough to reproduce. And that's it. Everything else is just icing on the cake. Individuals don't evolve their genes are set, so they're always going to be the way they are. But a population can change over time. Genes will change over generations. Things will become more popular or less popular. A population will evolve. That's basically evolutionary biology in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it and lots of interesting things, but we can leave it there for now. I don't want to overwhelm you. But trust me, there's lots of interesting examples of this in nature. Maybe we'll talk about them more sometime. <laughs>